So first off, a little history on the NHIN. I'm fortunate enough to have been around for almost all of this. We have a lot of people who have participated in various capacities the last few years. I actually started working with... Well, I'm sorry. Did I skip? I thought she... I am Joe Griffin. I'm with Health Information Technology. I have spent roughly the last year and a half working at the Office of National Coordinator on the NHIN. And one of my areas of expertise, if you will. And in spite of what it says in the program, I'm not really from California. I'm actually from Kansas, and I'll hold that again. <laughs> and, and Jonah missed a really critical point when we talked about the highway presence. Still here, Jonah? And do you know what it was? Uh, the first stretch of Interstate Highway was in Kansas. <laughs> Along with the world's largest ball of twine. <laughs> So a few years back, I was working up to work with Mendocino and a company called Browser Soft on the NHIN as part of the prototype architecture. There were four groups working at that time, and the idea was to develop, due to the sound, an initial prototype architecture that we could use to build out a nationwide health information network. That was about a two-year project, including in a presentation in D.C. that uh, Will was part of for us. I know some people here were part of that. And last year, we moved into what was called the trial implementation which is a really exciting phase for us. We're taking these four prototype architectures and with some significant help from West, I know West is all right, right here, good man, took a look at those and said, okay, which do we go for with? How do we sort this out? How do we get into now actually taking this to trial? And so a number of organizations were awarded contracts for the trial, and some of those folks are here with us today in California. And we accomplished several important things that we're going to need to rely on today for the demonstration. First off, the idea of the interface specification. And there were a number of interface specifications, but three of them that you'll see again and again today is this idea of what we call subject discovery. That is finding the patient just as the sound. And we don't usually think of the subject. Realize this is a propeller is together, right? <laughs> so they're subject. We also are going to look at query for documents. So that is this idea of, you know, do you have documents out there for us? So if we go ask for you, do you have documents about Joe Griffin Pell? And finally, the return of those and retrieve those documents. So every demonstration you see today is dependent upon these three interface specifications. Secondly, we're going to be looking at data specification fundamentally the summary record. I'm going to talk about that in just another minute here. And then one more that I wanted to mention because you'll hear this acronym tossed around and a lot of you probably don't know it's the idea of a DERSA. It's the data use for reciprocal support agreement. That is the idea of how do we build trust? How do we sign an agreement that allows us to exchange data between different organizations, different health information exchanges? Or if you're part of this nationwide group or the national nationwide group, then how do you really do this from the perspective of from one what we call NHIE, nationwide health information exchange, to another NHIE? Just lastly, in February, the first limited production of the NHIN came online. That was between Med Virginia and the Social Security Administration. Pretty exciting. There are still about 20 plus folks in the collaborative working towards you know, additional people coming online with this. And next year, I believe we'll see more production and more dollars coming from OMC to see this happen. There are no test patients were harmed in the showing of this data. Um, no real patients were harmed in the showing of this data either, but this is all test data. However, the scenarios are based on realistic clinical episodes. We had physicians say, this is how it happens. This is how it goes in the real world, and this is what we want you to do. This is the scenario we wanted to show you. 
what we have found with this experiment of connecting California using the NHIN gateway, taking existing health information exchanges, is that rapid deployment of health information exchange to support the ARA goals is possible. Technology is here today. It's shovel ready. But that's the technology. The next step is the agreement and laws. And of course, we all know that the agreements and laws are so much easier than the technology because the technology only took us 20 years. The agreements and laws should take us a week or two. And we need to leverage the existing HIEs and align with the ONC guidance to the states. And, and leveraging them actually does do that. So our goal here is to say it can be done, and we can do it with anybody who's ready, willing, and able to get it done. Next slide. Our goals are to show improved clinical outcomes for our fake patients. Mm -hmm. We wanted to accomplish statewide and national health information exchange. You're going to see information that, that really is moving across the entire nation from Mendocino to Santa Cruz to Los Angeles to Orange County and Washington, D.C. And our goal was to position California to support HIE implementation grants and showcase some of our existing health information exchange capabilities. We also have an intent to lower the barrier for any provider to get access to clinical data. So our demonstration participants are ER Connect from Orange County, Redwood MedNet, Kaiser Permanente, Santa Cruz Health Information Exchange, and Long Beach Network for Health. And the technology partners are Axolotl Elysium, Kaiser Permanente, MedPlus Centergy, NHIN Connect, Community Portal, and Morse Corp. These are all the technologies that are driving this demonstration today. And now we're going to move directly into the Orange County ER Connect demonstration. Hi, I'm Tom Rogan with Connect Chemistry, one of the technology partners in ER Connect Orange County. As you may know, the ER or may not know, actually, ER Connect is connecting all point tree hospitals in Orange County. We have our Lazy Connect partners, which are our PCPs that are currently also logging on to a separate portal that we have as well as our clinic, our clinic Connect. This is a production use today in all of our other concerns. ER Connect sort of took a similar spin to what uh, Dr. Henning said, which is incrementally grow labs, radiology, planes all these sorts of things. And you've got to the point where we're looking for what's next. We have to be able to do the laundry. It's been a way out across patients who play all in and you can walk on the beach ourselves and we're coming very close. So while not across and each on that map, we're very close and we do know we have patients. We try to discuss how we're going to change. Well, CMC5. Well, not that. So the 19, 18, whatever you want to say. Uh, each on seven. Well, maybe. How are we going to identify patients? Are we going to exchange a meaningful set of data that is both small enough to use, but okay, big enough to use, big enough to use the data? So we had a meeting and we were talking on ideas, and then basically my, my road appeals her, if you will, was Laura saying, well, I haven't had this in the gateway. And, uh, you know, down the rabbit hole I went. So, so what do we need to do? We need to identify patients in real time or in real time that we had across uh, our boundaries, and we need to get the data back. I actually went to her on screen. She has a claim on my claim to the tree. She has hospital activity. And I can click through and show you this. However, you guys have all seen this sort of thing before. What we added to this presentation, and I'll add this, it's indeed kind of slow as the end of the day. That's what we want to see. Here's Julia. I can select one or more networks that I have one more engine partners. I'm going to select on these help for help. I'm going to click on this button and I'm going to say create request. Right now, on our million dollar rounds network, we're going from our data center to the end of the gateway over to Long Beach Network for Health. Every five seconds, I'm going to go look and see if I found this patient. You see that I found her, Shirley Winters, at Long Beach. I'm now going and doing the document query, document retrieval. You see the request is complete. I've got the documents. And that was literally all in the space of seconds. I'm going to see. I'm going to go ahead and 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 I have a summary of episode and a laboratory. So in summary of episode, as you may know, is the performance of CTV, and here it is. Uh, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to pretend to know what carbamundin thing is, but it sounds like a bad. And now we know. <laughs> and now we know. And now we know that Julie Winters in my ER should not be prescribed that. <laughs> Where are we going to go next? We're going to put this in production. We have plans to use this in real scenarios. Where we're going to go back and down, push the button, but I just did, I'd like for our physicians to be able to search the results 
and uh, that good splint leg for the doctor's button version that we see now. And that's a good one. Okay, I'm Will Ross, and thanks everyone for coming to the event. And we're going to show how Reverend Bennett is using the Connect software to establish a gateway that enables from Reverend Bennett a query out to the end, out to the ending, and back with documents. So what you're looking at on screen right now is we're inside of Reverend Bennett portal. And just to set expectations a little bit, like my mom was saying, we don't require all users to use our portal because our web services, our service oriented architecture enables us to push data into the local application. So we have a portal in case you are a practice that doesn't have an application to run uh, the electronic data workers. So we're in our application right now. We're going to go to this tab over here on the right that says NHIN search. So we've, we've opened up the RevenBanet gateway we're looking at the swarm of data that's visible to you as a user when you're logged into every minute. And what you can see is based on your permission. So there's a whole security envelope around what you're allowed to see when you log in. And we're, we're coming at this right now from the patient view of a provider who's going to search on the end here for records for um, a uh, fake patient named Gallo Younger, who was a very famous patient from uh, last December's uh, demonstration in, in Washington. And what we're doing right now is we have identified other health information exchanges, uh, other NHIM gateways, and we're querying right now. And you can see as the documents line up below, as they arrive, they, they line up in a list. We don't have a, a clinical story for ours. Um, we're just showing that we that Reverend Manette's gateway, by, by using the Connect software, we're able to connect to the other four sites and pull down a document. We're also able to post documents that the other four sites can query from our gateway. And that's the basic game-changing uh, technology gap that we're all trying to cross to enable it to be possible to operate a gateway that is able to share data. We have some agreement issues, URSA agreements and, and business operating agreement issues and security and, and policy issues to cover, but this shows the technology enabling the regular bad net implementation to, to go across the internet using these federal standards, the federal health architecture, and bring back a record from a Kaiser or where do we bring this one back from here? Is this all in Orange County? So, and that's basically what I want to show. Hi, I'm John Madden from Kaiser Permanente. I just wanted to reflect on a couple of things that, that John mentioned too in his brilliant description of the, the challenges that we're facing. He mentioned that Kaiser Permanente we spent between five and six billion dollars on creating our own internal public information exchange between all of our regions. A lot of people assume that was an easy task because we're all in the company. We all get along really well. They went to the And he endured many of the long arguments, the names that we can gladly characterize that way, um, about how to do this. One of the comments, and I know that $6 billion I was accountable for spending $2 billion of it. Um, and we actually came in $200 million in the budget to the year ahead of schedule. So this is doable. That's one of the one of the most important things to realize. This is not an impossible task. It's very difficult task to run. Not impossible. My background in clinical care, in critical care, and in adult primary care medicine. One of the other things that Jonah mentioned is, is that people assume that integrating lab radiology and pharmacy with electronic health record is, you know, a little like free crazy. And, and I have to tell you, it's not. As we were implementing the system and debugging it, we had to build large new components of software to make our vendor software scale to an organization our size. We had many tense nights where we had people up all night long working through some of these low-lying fruit um, <laughs> that are not all low lying. In fact, the one very memorable call, uh, which lasted the entire night, we had people from four continents mm -hmm. on the call giving technical advice about how to troubleshoot problems that none of our vendors 
our experience before within their own software. So it is a, a complex task, but it can be done and it has been done through the use of interoperability. I personally, uh, as Joe mentioned earlier, been involved uh, in using standards on one of the co-founders of the uh, kind of the architecture that, that gave her the company care doctrine, which was to the uh, West Virginia for many years in each of so, And even I want to mention that we make no HIPAA violations of any of these downloads. These are our live environments, not even live patients from websites that. And we assume that all of our consents are in place. So we have processes for the consents that are, um, in fact, in place. But we're not going to be uh, digressing to that. One other thing I want to mention is that people have sort of assumed that Kaiser Permanente is a very closed system and we have our millions of members and thousands of doctors and we treat the same patients every day. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that people today are very mobile, they change jobs, and they change jobs, they change health plans and providers. And so we have a fairly large number of patients every single year who are new members to us. And our ability to provide continuity care and comprehensive care is highly dependent upon our having access to health information exchange. So we have an enormous stake um, in this problem. Um, the last thing I want to mention is in all of these demos of 2D you've already seen the one I'm going to show, there is a single common element, and that is we're showing the exact same data set based on a continuity care document, problems, medications, and allergies. Uh, the look and feel of what we're showing, you'll notice in each of these demos, and mine will be different than the two preceding, is different. That's a good thing. So this solution provides for very common sets of data that services it within the native application that the physicians and nurses and pharmacists are accustomed to using. So that, that illustrates the power and flexibility of the National Information Network which does not require any specific software. You can use open source, you can use proprietary, you can use vendor provided software. And it is the commonality of the interoperability standards that enable it. So with that, I'd like to start with a demo. And um, again, we, we have um, our system, and this is, this is our test system. And to Laura's comments about technology all that's going on, Joe Columna, who's driving the screen remotely now, and I did a dry run last night at 11.30 uh, p.m., almost. <laughs> <laughs> we got these horrible, fatal-looking errors on the screen, and it took us 20 minutes to overcome our shock and dismay that maybe we couldn't do a demo this morning to realize that we were trying to do a demo during the test system's <laughs> nightly backup. <laughs> So we agreed that we could fix that problem. We're never doing live demos at 11.20 at night. Okay. So this is a live system. This is our Health Connect system. Um, and it's completely comprehensive across all kinds of community. Every single doctor is not any 100% of our doctors are using the system today. And we're um, looking at the chart of a patient who's coming to visit up. And this is a, a patient who actually lives in Washington, D.C. Kaiser Permanente member in Washington who is testing, so all fictitious, and he's on assignment. And he's been working in Long Beach, he's received some treatment at Long Beach and a few other places. Then he, he shows up with us with a recurrence of his migraine, which is related to his post-traumatic stress disorder, which is related to his service in Iraq. So he's a 32-year-old veteran of the Iraq War who has long-term sequelae of that uh, tour of duty. And he's been receiving care at Kaiser Permanente in Washington, D.C., and then in Long Beach, and back at Kaiser. And he comes in complaining of a recurrence of his headache. He says, you know that, I've had these migraines for a while, and they're always the same, just on the right side of my head, and I can barely open my eyes, because the light hurts so bad. Um, and they put me, you know that, you know the red pill, they put me on the red pill back when I was in D.C., and then when I, when I went to Long Beach, they put me in the blue capsule. You know the blue capsule, Dr. Madison. <laughs> so I said, uh, you know, well, actually, it was, it was a couple of red pills. <laughs> um, and so maybe, maybe we can find something online. Do you remember the name of your medications? And it says, no, this is a red pill in the blue capsule. I said, okay, well, let's see if we can get some help here. So we, we're going to check and see. So um, if there's uh, any more information, so we have a more article about which is baked into our system um, within Kaiser Permanente. 
And lo and behold, we can, we can see that uh, Joe's been seen at the VA, at the DOD, Long Beach. So I asked him, where was the last place you were seen? He's not the last place I've seen in Long Beach. So let's take a look. So we put back on Long Beach. Again, this is live system, live interfaces, test patients. And we see that, indeed, he's got a uh, summary document from very recently, July the 10th. So we're going to pull it up. And we see that it has the elements of the continuity care document there with uh, allergies, problems, and medications. So maybe we can find out what's been going on and what the red pill and the blue capsule was. So why don't we uh, open the document up here and Joe, if you will, to the next screen. Okay, so we can see that uh, he's been on uh, Depakote, okay? Um, and prior to that, he had been on Buspirone. So now we know what the red pill and the blue capsule are. And we can actually make some real judgments about how to take care of him. So uh, take a little more history and say, well, we're not going to go back to the red pill. But what we're going to do is we're going to have to use the dose of your blue pill and uh, double your dose of uh, Depakote and see if that doesn't help your migraines. And uh, I get a call back a couple of days later from uh, Joe and his migraines completely resolved and he's very grateful and much appreciative of the fact that we could not only treat him effectively but know his clinical history by virtue of having this connection. So that's how the system is designed to work where you can pull up the information that is absolutely critical to the continuity of care and the safety of managing a patient. And when Joss was mentioning earlier about uh, carbonazepine sounded like a really dangerous drug, I have to tell you a personal story. When I was in high school, a very close friend of mine I was hospitalized at Stanford for three months with a very rare side effect of carbonazepine. And had these systems that we have in place today been in place at that point in time, he would have been taken off of that drug three months earlier. Um, than he was. And so, yes, indeed, you could guess it's a very dangerous drug, nearly killed a friend of mine. Um, and it's these very kinds of systems that can help prevent those kind of deaths. So now I'm going to pass it off to Bill Bay from the Santa Cruz project. Excuse me, I'm Bill Bay from Santa Cruz, and I'm uh, more of a technician, more of a technologist, and uh, I'm not at all a doctor, so I'll be nearly as intelligent as Dr. Madison. That I'm going to uh, take you through a scenario that our doctor wrote for us that assured me that it is <laughs> So uh, we're in the Santa Cruz emergency room, and there's a patient, Samuel Norcal, who's a 66-year-old uh, retired surfer. Uh, <laughs> This is in Santa Cruz, and he had also lived in uh, Long Beach and, uh, and up in Mendocino. So, so we're bringing up the uh, local uh, view of the page of data in the application that's been used throughout Santa Cruz called Lithium. And we can see the demographics of the patient. And, uh, and the patient says, you know, I, I know who my cardiologist is, but I don't know who my uh, PCP is. And, uh, and we say, uh, uh, Sam, in your PCP, call the Frank, and he says, oh, that's right. And, and we say, you know what medications you're on, because he's complaining of chest pain. And said, I, I remember two of the four, but I don't remember all four. So because I'm not the doctor that did the entire work on this patient, I need to click this button here that says show medical information. And I click that. And um, I have to attest that I have a treatment relationship with this patient so that I can see more clinical information. And as you can see, it opened up more information here. And uh, I can see a, a few things. Locally here in Santa Cruz, we found that he has a penicillin allergy from an earlier uh, um, report. And we found all four medications and we verified those in him. Uh, and here you can see that, that uh, he was diagnosed several years ago uh, and treated had a heart bypass. Uh, so in the beginning then, uh, he said that the reason he today is that he came back and that he had about a week ago. And it happened when he was in Mendocino, when he went to the Mendocino ER. So he said, okay, well, let's go ahead and query to see if we can find out uh, about what happened in Mendocino, because 
because he's also told me that they gave him a drug that um, they had a, they gave him a bad headache. So, um, well, I, I'm either talking too much or the system's working really great or you all cut down your, your wireless. <laughs> um, it doesn't usually come back this quickly. So, anyway, let's take a look at the, uh, at the clinical data. You can see we found some clinical data here in, um, in Mendocino, in Ukiah. And, um, and as I scroll down, I can see that um, I can see that they gave him a nitro patch, and that must be the uh, medication or the treatment that gave him the headaches. And he said, "Yeah, let's not let's not do that again." And so, um, in any event, uh, they they also had uh, because he also lived there for a period of time, noted that he had an iodine allergy. So we learned some more data about this patient. And uh, when we reminded him of that, he confirmed that. Um, so we, we also want to go and see, because uh, he lived most of his life in, um, in Long Beach. We're pulling up his Long Beach information. You can see here's his, his past address in Long Beach. And scroll down, but oh, it's the bottom of the document. So uh, <laughs> the uh, the allergy that was noted there was Bactrim, was a uh, drug allergy related to Bactrim. So with, with all this information, uh, we were able to determine that he was not having another heart uh, situation, but rather he just needed to have his medications changed. And by learning all this information, we were able to make the right prescription and avoid invasive and potentially expensive uh, surgery. And then we'll bring up Dr. Josh Edelman, my Hi. Uh, thanks, Laura. So I think we're a little short on time, so we'll keep this quick. Um, we're going to show you the Long Beach Network for Health portal. So the past patient that we're going to talk about is uh, George Big Patient. Uh, and, uh, Hang on. The patient grew up in uh, Santa Cruz. He had acute lymphocytic leukemia at the age of 10. After that, the patient moved around to uh, several other cities where his HIVs are present. So, uh, one of those patients uh, has data uh, that's, that's uh, accessible because he lived in the right places all his life so far. Uh, today, we're going to take on the role of an ED physician, and we're going to say that this patient became very short of breath at work and was intubated in the field, so we can't provide any information. In the emergency department, the patient has a very high white blood cell count, and uh, that's the main laboratory abnormality. So without knowing, the ED physician wouldn't know because the patient can't talk about the history of leukemia. The ED physician may assume that the patient has a, a pneumonia. So after perhaps uh, going through the history and physical examination, treating the patient, or beginning the treatment for pneumonia, we get to the point where the ED physician says, maybe I should uh, look and see if there's any available HIE data on this patient. So, Santa Cruz. Uh, in Santa Cruz, particularly, because uh, he was wearing a uh, Santa Cruz elementary school t-shirt. <laughs> so, this is all plausible, right? <laughs> um, so we have the record up here, and we see that in 1992, the patient had this uh, diagnosis of acute lymphocytic leukemia. Of course, uh, the HIE, no one was uh, inputting data at that point, but we assume that the patient's uh, diligent primary care physician uh, has input this data at a, uh, at a visit in the last year or so in updating the patient's history. So with that information, the emergency room physician can say, wait a minute, this may not, this may not only be pneumonia, it may be uh, also a relapse of leukemia. I'm going to get the oncologist on board at this time. So uh, this is another example of how the uh, patient can have improved quality of care, earlier diagnosis, and treatment based on the HIE data. Uh, and we think at Long Beach that, uh, as Joan mentioned, the biggest uh, improvements are going to be due to uh, the structured data and the clinical decision support that is based on that structured data that has been shown in the other demonstrations. But uh, we figure that uh, those will be shown a lot, so we try to show something different. And I think this also shows that even beyond those improvements, there are probably going to be a lot of 
improvements in quality and efficiency of care that are just going to come up on a on a day-to-day -day basis, even when you don't see, even when you don't have structured data that feeds into medical decision support technology. So our one small step for a health information technology exactly for patient care. We've seen now really the continuity of care two levels. First level within health information exchange, and now extending that beyond the local health information exchange to become between exchanges. Thank you. First of all, uh, that was a series of fortunate events, and I think our panelists deserve a round of applause. And we will bid a fond farewell to the folks on our webinar.